The great world champion Mikhail Tal is famous for his spectacular and often speculative sacrifices. However, there is one sacrifice that he famously rejected. Playing against Bent Larsen in a critical candidates match after e4 and knight to f6, Tal rejected a tempting sacrifice. The game continued with e5, knight d5, d4, pawn d6, knight f3. This line is really popular, by the way, and it occurs in some very high level games. And we get a trade on e5, and knight takes e5. I want to mention here that I play this line and I recommend the move c6 here. And if you're interested in playing Alyekin's defense, I can recommend that to you. But instead, Larson played the move knight d7 and Tal spent 50 minutes here thinking. Basically, by the way, never think for 50 minutes. If you're going to do this, go ahead and do it and conserve some time, right? And if you're not going to do it, then go ahead and play something else and again, conserve some time. You're never going to be able to calculate so deeply as to justify a 50 minute think here on move six. And I'm sure Tao would agree with that, by the way. Tao's intuition was screaming at him that knight takes f7 was the right move. You can see it's the second most popular move here in the database, but I really think it deserves to be the most popular. After knight takes f7, not black's knight, white's knight, uh, king takes f7 here, we have queen h5 check. Note that you don't have queen f3 check because black can block on f6 and the fried liver kind of attack isn't working. We need queen h5 check instead. Queen h5 check hits the king and the knight and forces the king up to e6. Really, I think that Mikhail Tal at this point should have gone, I'm Mikhail Tal, I'm the greatest attacker the world has ever seen, and there's a king on e6. I'm going to play this, and we'll figure it out. If he can defend against me, then okay, right? To be fair, he basically used that strategy in a famous game against Mikhail Botvinnik in the World Championship, and things did not work out. But this is a little different. That king is much more exposed on e6 than Mikhail Botvinnik's king was in that famous world championship game. And I think that our intuition can lead us to a very strong conclusion for white here. Now, in the database, the most popular move is c4. And I don't think that's the best move, but let's look at it real quickly. After c4, the knight can pull back and hit the queen. We get d5 check. The king runs over, queen f7. This is a very strong move, threatening near mate after this, but knight e5 does develop counterattack the queen. White can play bishop f4, and then black can play c5, and things are crazy complicated. There's so much to get in here, and I'm not going to get into any of it. Instead, I'm just going to say that black has done a reasonable job defending this position, and you can even see that in 20 games here, black has outscored white, and so I'm not going to recommend that you play this line. I do think we have an improvement though. If we back up on move eight, here, instead of c4, we can play the second most popular, but much better scoring, pawn to g3. And I think this idea is pretty straightforward and really effective. We're just going to leverage massive pressure here on this long diagonal, and I think that means we're going to win the knight back on d5, and we're going to maintain an attack. After pawn g3, which is scored really well in postal play, correspondence play. They use email now. It's it's come a ways since there were stamps involved. But anyway, in those serious games, after g3, white has done really well. We should mention the move knight f5, f6, although it's only played once in this database. It does attack the queen, but after this series of checks, white creates a monster pin here that's super hard to get out of. And by super hard, I think I basically mean impossible. C4 is a huge threat. B5 basically always gets met by A4. And after, say, B4, again, trying to hold on and stop this C4 move, you just push it anyway. And after an ampassant capture, the move is still coming. You're going to be able to play C4, win a knight on D5, and maintain an attack against a black king that is never going to be happy. And you have a great bishop on the long diagonal and can castle at any point. It's a very, very nice attack. And I think that you can play this and be confident that you should have a large, if not completely winning advantage. However, backing up, I want to mention like one alternative here. After the move g3 here, 
a lot of players do go ahead and play pawn to b5 right away. Basically, you're going to do the same thing here, right? So not much is changing, but this is the most popular move, and I want to mention it here. Go ahead and play a4 and keep your goal in mind. Don't play bishop takes b5. Your goal is to play c4 and put the bishop on the long diagonal. Keep that in mind and don't get distracted by the uh, simple capture of a pawn on b5. Again here, if the pawn pushes, you're just going to be pushing onward here and trying to push c4 and put your bishop on the long diagonal and your attack is tremendous. I'm going to leave it there, although there's much more to analyze, but I hope that you can use this sacrifice in your own games and perhaps realize the fantastic attack that White has that Mikhail Tal for once left on the table.